what is Jesus telling you about the world? Not what is the world telling us about Jesus? Because what does the world say about Jesus? Oh, he's a nice guy. Oh, he was a lunatic. Oh, he was this. Oh, you know, you poor, you poor ignorant people, you have to rely on your religion to get you by. I'm going to rely on my relationship with Jesus Christ to get me by. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so verse, verse number two. Um, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to you. Now, I know some of you guys like to listen to talk radio, and you like to listen to the shows that make you absolutely aggravated. Uh, Callie was running yesterday in the 5K run, and she said there were some people handing out the information, just being real aggressive and all that stuff, and she wanted to stop and fight them, but, but she wasn't allowed to. So, um, but, but, you know, I, I've watched Bill Maher. I've watched clips of Bill Maher's show maybe three times. It makes me so mad. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt my TV, so I should just move, move along. But you know what? I really think about him. I don't think he hates Christians. He hates the th- because he's convinced that Christianity is some cruel hoax played on the, the simpletons. And he just feels sorry for me, simpleton. He doesn't want anybody to take advantage of me. And I think this is part of what this scripture is saying, that there are going to be people who are going to come against the church. There are people who are going to come against God. There are people who are going to come against Christ and the Holy Spirit. And, and they really think they're doing us a favor. Oh, man, you poor, misguided person. Man, I, I'm so sorry that you, you've bought into the lie that there's some you know, huge being out there. It's like, I'm sorry, you've, poured in, you've, you've bought into the lie that there's not some huge ultimate king of kings and lord of lords. I kind of like knowing there is one God, and I'm related to him. Uh, that, I find that comforting. So Jesus says, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. They think they're doing you a favor. When Jesus looked down from the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're doing the church. They think they're doing you a service by putting me, this, this rebel, this blasphemer, they're putting me to death. They think they're doing you a favor. They don't even know what they're doing. Verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Sometimes I'm really shocked when non-believers act like non-believers. I shouldn't be shocked when non-believers act like non-believers. I should be more shocked when believers act like non-believers, but I I tend to to be way more concerned about the other thing. Um, Now the next couple verses. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. Um, Years ago, Jesus was withholding some information from these guys. Um, As he's, you know, I, I heard one guy say, you know, that's not really what Jesus wanted to walk up on the beach that first day when he's, when he's calling disciples, come and follow me, you'll be fishers of men, and men will hate you and put you to death, and you'll, it'll be horrible. But it'll all work out in the end. I mean, he didn't start that way. He walk, he's walking through, they're seeing his power, they're seeing his love for them, and little bit by little bit. But now it's getting close, and he wants them to know, look, don't let it surprise you when these bad things happen. That would, that would, the, the, the enemy will use that to drive you away. I'm going to use that to drive you closer because I'm going to tell you it's going to happen ahead of time so that when it happens, you can go, yep, that's exactly what he said was going to happen. So uh, now back to my story. Years ago, back in the day, I took golf lessons. And um, the, 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 the pro at the place that I went, um, he, he said, we're going we're gonna to learn to use your clubs in the order that you will use them on the golf course. So he started with drivers, and then he went to irons, and then he went to the wedges, and then he went to the uh, putter. Little did I know um, that I was going to you know, spend way more time with the sand wedge than any other tool. I should have used that mostly. But it was because he figured, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you the thing that you're going to need first. And that's what Jesus has been doing. He's been teaching them the things that they needed first. It wasn't, he wasn't withholding information, but he was giving it out as they needed it. How many of you all understand that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, is a perfect teacher? He doesn't overload you with stuff you don't need to know. He doesn't, he doesn't boggle your mind with some future thing until you've 
grasp the concept that he's trying to teach you right now. He's, a, he's an awesome teacher. He's a perfect teacher, which means he does what, homeschool moms? He teaches every one of us individually. He doesn't teach us that all, of, all students learn the same exact way. There's, there's one program, and you have to match the program, or I'm sorry, you're out of it. He tailor makes the program for each of us as students. What does that show? It shows that he loves us. He's not saying, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you think differently. Uh, I should have thought about that when I designed you, but, um, but your process, you're going to have to cut your process time in about half because you need to keep up. He doesn't do that. He's like, look, you need longer to process. This guy, he doesn't need very long to process. You need time to react. This guy doesn't need any time to react. He is just beautiful in the way that he does it. So Jesus is going to point out the fact that none of us knew exactly where Jesus was going. No one's asked about that because they've been kind of distracted by the other stuff. Verse 7 says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, um, I don't know why I thought about this. It was kind of a spiritual equivalent to a Dear John letter. You know, um, uh, Dear So-and-So... I, um, I, I'm just, I, I just feel like you should probably look for somebody else. Like, you know, I'm, just, I'm not good enough for you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the best fit for you, which what, what they really mean is I have found three other people that I really like other than you. Jesus isn't saying, okay, I, I, I'm not really the person for you. I think what he's saying is, look, there is a timeline. There is a plan that's been set in motion since before the foundation of the earth, and it is that I will go, I will take the wrath of the Father, you then will be able to enjoy being the, the holy temple of the living God. Because the holy temple of the living God has to be righteous, it has to be pure. And so the Holy Spirit can't live inside you until I go and pay your sin debt. And once I pay your sin debt, then guess what? You become a, 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 a worthy vessel to hold the Holy Spirit, the holy presence of God. So it's just a timeline thing. Is, you know, is Jesus, Jesus can't be in the same room with the Holy Spirit, can't be in the same room with God. I don't, it doesn't work that way. But, but Jesus is just saying, look, there is a process and, and the process is working. The plan is working and it's a great plan. So it's good for you that I go because I can only be in one place at one time. But when the Holy Spirit, the advocate comes in, guess what? He lives inside you. He's always where you are because he is inside you. He is closer than your breath. He lives inside you. Now, if you're going to, um, uh, how many, does anybody here have the little electric car? Anybody here have an electric car so far? How many of y'all want to get one of those that looks like a toaster? I expect at any moment for, for a big piece of bread to pop out of the top of them. It's really funny. Okay, so, so what if though, you could actually, you could, you could stop every 30 feet and plug the thing in and recharge it. Or they would give you like a nuclear nugget that you just open it and you throw that pot in there. And then it's like, you know, back to the future where it keeps you going for, for a long, long time. I mean, that would be awesome. How many of us would do that? Okay, that'd be good. But then when we go, ah, but I don't want to drive very far. Ah, you know, okay, it says, it says it's good for the next billion miles. Eh, I don't want to I don't, I don't really put any miles on it, though. I wanna sp we have the holy presence of God living inside of us, and most of us are willing to go, eh, I don't really want to use him today. I don't want to use him all up. I don't want to trouble God. I don't, I don't want to put the Holy Spirit out and, and like come to him with this, with this minuscule problem that I have. I think I'll work on it myself. That should work out fine. Anybody ever? Yeah. I'm going to... God, I've got this. You just sit back in your easy chair. I'll call you in about 30 seconds when I really need you. Verse 8, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about three things. Sin, righteousness, judgment. The world's opinion and understanding of the concept of sin, righteousness, and judgment is wrong. How do I know it's wrong? Because it's the world's opinion. It's not God's opinion. There are some people in the world who have the same opinion as God, but the world, the flesh, the devil, their opinion of all those things is just absolutely wrong. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, 
Everything he says is absolutely true and 100% true. He, he is going to come. All right, so number, number, uh, verse number nine. About sin, because people do not believe in me. Your sin is going to send you to hell. Because you did this sin, you're going to go to hell. Because you've committed this sin, you're going to go to hell. Many of us were raised to believe that. You're going to the doctor. You walk in the doctor. The doctor looks at you and says, I got your test results back, and you have terminal cancer, and you have about a week to live. That's bad news. Yes, it's bad news. However, I have this pill that's just been approved. If you take it, it will not only make you survive, but it will completely eliminate that cancer from your body. Well, that's good news. Okay, would you like the pill? I think I'm going to get a second opinion. Uh, I think, I don't know, isn't there an easier way? Is it, I mean, the, what sends people to hell is not their sin, it's the refusal to take the sin bearer. You see, you and I, as Christians, we recognize the sin bearer. We've taken the sin bearer on as our, as our advocate, as our propitiator. And so we're cured. How much sin do we have left? None, because he took it all. Every bit of it, he took it all. The reason people will not go and spend eternity with the Father is because they refuse the Son. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the unpardonable sin. Why is it unpardonable? Because you will not recognize that there is something that you have to do. You won't recognize who Jesus is. So the first thing they're saying about sin is, see, the world's got it all wrong. Sin is about as long as I'm better than you and as long as I'm not as bad as you. And how many of y'all, uh, how many of y'all could probably jump farther than me? Thank you, Sally. Okay, so if Sally and I were to stand on the curb... She's going to jump farther than I am. Absolutely. And if salvation was based on who gets to jump farthest, she'd be in, I'd be out. Unfortunately, we're both standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. It doesn't matter who jumps farther. We can't jump over the Grand Canyon. You cannot earn your own salvation. You can't. I don't care how many doors you knock on. I don't care how many Bible verses you memorize. I don't care how good you are. It's like trying to jump over the grain. I heard a guy say one time, he said, okay, who can throw a baseball farther, me or you? And the guy was a baseball player. He's like, obviously you can. He goes, okay, but who can hit the moon with a baseball? Neither of us. And that's what, that's what living a pure and holy life apart from Christ is like. It's impossible. It can't be done. But guess what? I have that nuclear-powered thing called the Holy Spirit living inside me. I can do exactly as he does, as long as I'm willing to follow him, as long as I'm willing to connect with him. And that's the reason uh, old sins will begin to become like, man, why did I ever do that? That was, man, I don't, I don't need to do that. Why would I want to do that? I don't need to do that. That's not where life is. There's, there's no joy there. I used to think there was joy there, but then I realized it's joy followed by a lot of guilt, shame, grief, separation. So about sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Jesus had been accused of being unrighteous. He was, he'd been accused of blasphemy. He'd been, he'd been uh, more than one time they tried to kill him because he was, he was saying, I am the Son of God. I'm, I'm connected to God, all these other things. He said, look, they don't even understand what the righteousness of Christ is really like. And when I go to this place where I'm going to go and I take all of the wrath the Father has, then I'm going, to, there, I'm going to be able to show righteousness in a whole new way that right now... See, the world thought righteousness was, well, if you'll keep the Ten Commandments and the other 453 things that we've added to the commandments, and if you do this and you do that, never mind that your heart is completely black as, as night, never mind that the inside of you is, is, is like a sepulcher, but on the outside you look really nice. That's what they thought was righteousness. You and I cannot be righteous without Christ. But once we have Christ, we can't not be righteous because we're wearing his righteousness. And I don't believe you can take on his righteousness and take it off and put it on and take it off and take it on and put it on. I think once it's on, it's 
tailor-made and it stays on there. And then 